In 1992, there were only five people on remote Campbell Island, more than 400 miles south of New Zealand, living together at the weather station. They all shared a deep love of nature, but on the afternoon of April 24, 1992, they were reminded that for all its splendor and glory, nature also has a dark side. Campbell Island's a really wild place with no contact with the outside world apart from our radio telephone. We didn't expect to see another ship or even a plane for the, for the whole time we were down there, the whole 12 months. On that day, communications specialist Robin Humphrey and the others had decided to stop work early. We were going to go across to the western side of the island, which is about an hour and a half's walk, to go for a swim with the sea lions. So we were all really keen to get out there and do it. You know, it's going to be something exciting to do for the afternoon. Linda Dannon was a first aid specialist in the group. Mike and I were planning to dive in this particular bay through the winter with the um, southern right whales. Mike Fraser was the team leader. We spent a lot of time together diving and he was the best dive buddy I've ever had. It's the first time in a long time the whole five of us had done an activity together. You know, we'd been together for, for five and a half months and we'd really clicked. We're on a mission. We're on a mission to have some fun. Last one in's in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Jacinda Amy was a Department of Conservation Ranger. We tried to see who could get down to the bottom and, and you're extremely buoyant so it was quite a struggle to dive down onto the bottom. And we, we were just, we were just larking around, it was, it was great. <laughs> Linda and Rob and Gus and I were all feeling much close together and Mike could flip it out a bit further. yelling and could see him thrashing around at something in the water. It was just, it was really awful. His body was outlined by the, um, by the pointed nose of a shark. And I thought Michael was dead or about to die and there wasn't anything we could do. I mean, you don't attempt to drag him away from a shark. I knew I should have gone for the shore. But I felt his, his pain and his terror, it was, it was just, it was really awful. It was unbelievable um, to, to see that happen in front of you. There was quite an ugly brown circle of, of blood. Mike! Suddenly Mike came up by himself and like trying to do a crawl stroke. But oh, it was just really pathetic to see his arms were, were floppy and useless. Jacinta got a hold of him. She was carrying a live piece of bait, and that shark was still out there. And Jacinta had no idea where the shark was. We directed her just around from the head end a little bit to where there was a shallow, sort of rocky shelf. Give me a hand, Lucinda. Give me a hand. His injury was very obvious to us at that stage. His right arm was missing from just below the elbow. He was having trouble breathing, and I thought, oh no, he's, he's not going to make it. The remoteness of our location really, really sunk into me for the first time, and how ill-equipped we were to cope with a situation like that. He's not breathing properly. One of the first things I did was to grab a strap off one of her masts and we wrapped that round his damaged arm just to try and contain the, the blood loss. 
Keep that press down. Keep that press down. You're talking about a 36-hour boat trip just to get him off the island. Um, you can't fly a, a small aeroplane into there. There's nowhere for him to fall into land. And I thought, this guy's not going to make it. I'm pretty certain he's going to die here. Push down. Push down. While Linda headed to a nearby hut for first aid supplies, the fastest member of the group, mechanic Gus McAllister, was chosen to run back to the base camp to radio for help. So I took a few instructions from Rob on how to get the radio transmission through, and um, I headed back over the big hill over to the base. You're okay, mate. Okay, hey, Mike, you now. with you. I got the water. I just tried to keep him from seeing his, his right arm. It, he just said to me, oh, no, it, it's all right, I've seen it, I know it's gone. And, and he'd really accepted it already at that stage. Hang in there, Mike. Oh, right, hang in there, Mike. First when I got back, the first thing I wanted to do was remove the tourniquet uh, and put proper pressure bandages on Mike's arm. If it's left on too long, you then start losing the rest of the good part of the arm. My dad had been a butcher, so I'd seen lots of things go through a mincer machine, and all I could think of, poor old Mike's arm was, you know, his arm just being completely shredded, just, just absolutely shredded with the, the sharpness of the, the, sh the shark's teeth. Well, find something to spin that arm up with. I'll use a snorkel. He was cold, he was in a severe state of shock, he'd suffered enormous blood loss, uh, he, he'd lost an arm, his other arm was severely lacerated and we had to, had to get him to shelter and our first thought was that, oh, we could, we'll get him up to the hut. Healing, Mike. He had raw nerves, even though we'd bandaged it up, just all the blood would just drain out of his face and uh, you could just see the pain that he underwent when we were trying to move him. And we'd only got about a third of the way and we couldn't go any further, so we decided we'll bring the hut to Mike. We're 460 miles away from New Zealand in a sub-Antarctic environment. Air temperatures at night are maybe 30 or 40 degrees Fahrenheit, very cold. That's why we set about getting all this equipment to get them warm. Rob brought back with him just whatever he could find so that we could make Mike comfortable because we knew that we're there for the night. Gus managed to run the five miles back to base camp within 45 minutes. According to their emergency plan, anyone injured on Campbell Island was to be evacuated by helicopter more than 450 miles to the nearest hospital. But it had never been done before. As time passed, Mike's condition continued to deteriorate. We were sitting in the tent trying to give Mike a lot of confidence, but even so, we knew that to get this helicopter off the ground and get it underway was going to take an awful long time, and uh, we just weren't certain if, if Michael had the strength remaining to, to last out that length of time. Pilot John Fennell had already been working 12 hours when they got the call. The flight that we were about to undertake is probably the longest flight that anyone in this part of the world has ever done in a helicopter. And we had to increase the range of the helicopter from three and a half hours up to at least six and a half and, and hopefully we would have enough fuel to then turn around and go somewhere else should we not be able to find the island. Gus brought back painkillers and antibiotics a doctor had prescribed over the radio. But there was no stockpile of blood on the island. Well, the concern was the navigational aspect. It was a small island in the middle of a, of a big ocean with nothing around it. Despite the risks, paramedic Pat Wynn had volunteered to be the medic on the flight. I was worried about major blood loss, but also whether the patient was still alive when we arrived. I must have been there about an hour and a half, and the fuel in the main tanks had uh, dropped. Uh, so she had to refuel the machine in mid-air. Mike. Doing real good. Doing really well. Hang in there, mate. The longer the, the wait for, for proper medical attention, the greater the risks were of Mike dying. Good on you, mate. That made the, the wait very long. Can I do anything? No, no. Okay. When the rescue helicopter finally got within range of Campbell Island, they made contact with a research ship that had come to the island to try to help but there was heavy cloud cover in the area. You see the tanker over there, Pat? No, I can't see lights at all. No. 
Yeah, hovering around for some time trying to find a hole for the cloud to get through. It was a relief to see the, the lights on the boat. So we're actually really, really elated that we made it. We actually finally did it. We were there. Up, he was deeply blue, cyanotic, which is a lack of oxygen. And uh, I asked the ladies concerned, his blood pressure, his last blood pressure, and they said they couldn't get it for the last hour, which means your kidneys are really starting to fail, and Michael's in a very serious state. Because it was so cold, Pat made the decision we should load him in the helicopter and take him across to the base on the other side of the island. Okay, that's it. Put on, Mike. Come on, you're doing good. John said to me, yes, I got into the first aid room. He says, um, how long are you going to need? I said, well, John, either way, either the patient dies or survive. So I'm going to need three hours to try and get this patient back to some condition before we can move out. All right, Michael, just going to get into your arm. Hang on there. That's a boy. He undid the, the splint where the snorkel was, and Mike's arm basically fell apart. So that meant that Mike had no right arm from his elbow down, and he lost his left arm. That was worse than seeing his arm taken off. I just couldn't believe that a, a, a shark would do so much damage to one person. Safe hands now. It's real sad. We'd been a real team. You know, and the team's broken. Um, you know, uh, you know, there are five um, real close people, and now it was time for that one team member to go. Thirty-two-year-old Mike Fraser was taken to the nearest hospital, where miraculously doctors were able to repair his damaged left arm. In the two years since the incident, he has adjusted to the loss of his right arm, and with physical therapy, he continues to slowly regain the use of his left. When I first saw the shark, I thought I was dreaming. Everything happened so quick, and I remember thinking at the time, oh, a shark, it can't be a shark, I mean, there's no sharks here. Then a second thought came across my mind that, oh, I know what it's like to drown now. It wasn't actually crossing my mind that here's the shark that's going to kill me. I thought I was going to drown. Speak to you that one. You seem to have it under control. Well, I'm doing okay now. Um, got a couple of spare arms. Uh, one sort of light one just for doing computer work, another one a bit more metal on and heavy duty for pruning pine trees. And I haven't found, really found anything that I cannot do now. It's good to see him up. And, and and about you know he he's not the sort of guy you can keep down he's he, he's he's pretty tough he's just gone on and lived and I, I really um, admire him him for doing that uh, yeah, he's done it well mm. <laughs> I'm extremely proud of Jacinda you know we were all what I call the herd instinct bolting for our lives and she had the instinct halfway back to to stop in the water she put her own safety. At risk, she stopped and she calmly assessed the situation. I think what Jacinda did is just the uh, one of the most amazing scenes I've ever contemplated in my life, I've ever witnessed. Extremely brave thing to do. Sid. The thing that, that saved Michael's life was actually the team on the island. If they hadn't uh, given the first aid they did as a team, Michael would have passed away. He would have died before I got to him. <laughs> People shouldn't be afraid of sharks at all. The odds on getting bitten by a shark are so phenomenally small, it's just not funny. So many more people get killed in car accidents and yet nobody thinks twice about jumping in the car and driving to work in the morning. Pruning season's been cutting off the tree. There's so many people involved. I'm just so, so extremely grateful to everyone. It was a case of good luck, good planning. Um, and just everything came off, but you know, I'm just extremely grateful to everyone involved. Angie. Come here. Come up Mike and I yeah, seem to have become an item. We started to see each other um, <laughs> quite a lot um, through last year and um, yeah, fell in love with each other and sort of thought um, this is the way to go. 
now we are together. Mm. Looking forward to long life together. <laughs>